this is a summary of the energy topic for higher geography. I will run through each of the outcomes, but you will need to add detail from your own course notes and your own case study research. The energy topic has three outcomes. One, the global distribution of energy resources. Two, the reasons for changes in demand for energy in both developed and developing countries. And three, the effectiveness of renewable and non-renewable approaches to meeting energy demands and their suitability within different countries. Before we look at these outcomes, let's consider some background knowledge. Energy is the power we use in our homes, schools, communities and across the nation. It also includes construction, transportation and manufacturing. Energy sources that can be described as renewable are sources that are not depleted as they are used. These would include things such as solar, wind, tidal, wave, hydroelectric and geothermal energy. Sources of energy that are described as non-renewable are sources that cannot be readily replaced by natural means on a level equal to their consumption. These include the fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas. When we're researching these fossil fuels, it can also be worthwhile considering their method of extraction, be it open cask, drilling or hydraulic fractionation, also known as fracking. There are some energy sources, such as nuclear and some forms of biomass energy, which do not fit nicely into these categories, and that's something you might want to research further. Outcome 1 looks at the global distribution of energy resources. Like many topics in geography, it can be useful to look at the issue's compass. The global distribution of energy resources is influenced by natural factors, economic factors, social factors, and importantly, who has the power. In this case, government policy and the access to technology and funding. Let's look at some examples. Here we see the nations which use geothermal energy. There is strong physical geography here, as the nations have a close proximity to crustal boundaries or other zones where magma is close to the surface. But economic factors are also important. Geothermal energy can involve high costs and complex technology, inhibiting some poorer nations. This graphic shows the distribution of countries who use nuclear energy. This is closely linked to the availability of funding and technology, but there are several countries around the world who choose to be nuclear free, highlighting the importance of government policy. This is particularly true since the Japanese earthquake of 2011, when the meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear plant caused some nations to reconsider their relationship with nuclear power. This graphic represents those nations who rely heavily on hydroelectric power. This shows a strong link between physical geography and economic geography. The countries which exploit hydroelectric power require sufficient water supplies in the form of rainfall or river flow, and a mountainous landscape is often attractive. But hydroelectric power schemes require funding. In the 1980s and 90s, these were particularly attractive to the World Bank, allowing poorer nations to exploit the potential. Hydroelectric power can also occur on several scales. They can be small for an individual landowner or community, or they can be large-scale national dam building projects. When being assessed in this outcome, you may face data such as these stacked bar graphs, which show the different methods of energy production used by selected countries. You may also be encouraged to talk about the countries that you have studied. So when answering these types of questions, think about the natural and physical factors, the economic factors, but don't forget the importance of government policy and the access to technology and funding. Remember to be country specific, and aim to discuss several energy sources. 
outcome two looks at the reasons for changes in demand for energy in both developed and developing countries. We can think about this in a number of ways. We can think about population change, industrial change, but we must remember the importance of consumerism and consumption. Let's start by looking at the developed countries. Data would suggest that those countries that we classify as developed have seen either a small increase, a plateauing, or in some cases a decrease in energy demand in recent decades. In simple terms, this might be due to populations being largely stable and to the relocation of high energy manufacturing industries to the developing countries of the world. But this hides a level of complexity. For a moment, think about how the life of a teenager in Scotland today varies to the lifestyle of those of us who grew up through the 1990s. Consider the role of energy in the technology, our patterns of retail, our transportation, how our houses are built and insulated, and even the amount of energy that's used in your school setting. These huge increases in energy demand have largely been masked by an increase in energy efficiency in the countries classified as developed. We must also bear in mind though the dual role of globalisation and how this consumption is measured. The majority of the products in our consumer rich lifestyle are manufactured and transported from the countries that we classify as developing. This artificially increases their demand in energy but suppresses the demand in energy for the countries we classify as developed. An analogy would be if I build the supermarket for the fuel that I use when collecting my shopping. Let's now look at those countries that we would classify as developing. Across the nations which we classify as developing countries, we see an increase in energy demand in recent decades. This is largely due to youthful populations and increases in life expectancy, combined with improvements in individual living standards. More households now have access to televisions, washing machines and fridges. But this also includes the large-scale national infrastructure programmes that we see across the world. Road building, airport building, housing improvements, hospitals and schools. Across the developing world, we also see an increasing amount of people with a large disposable income who can engage in a consumer-led lifestyle. We must also remember that in the developing countries, their increase in energy demand is linked to the relocation of manufacturing industries and the growth in international tourism. Much of this demand is to support our lifestyle in the developed world. When looking at countries that we classify as developing, we must ensure that our case studies are up to date. There are major social and economic changes continuing in countries across the world. When being assessed in this outcome, it is likely that you will face data that shows that developed countries are showing a plateauing of energy demand, while the developing countries are showing an increase in demand. This is in part due to population change and lifestyle and industrial change, but we cannot forget the importance of consumerism and globalisation. When answering these questions, also be careful to discuss the correct country grouping. Outcome 3 looks at the effectiveness of renewable and non-renewable approaches to meeting energy demands and their suitability within different countries. This means that we have to understand what is meant by effectiveness and suitability and we also have to have a case study of both renewable energy and non-renewable energy. When we think about effectiveness, we're asking how good is an energy source at meeting our energy demands. But if there are issues, is the issue with the source or is the issue with the technology and the funding of that technology? And please bear in mind that the effectiveness is constantly changing. 
In recent decades, the effectiveness of solar panels and wind turbines has improved massively. So ensure your case studies are up to date and factual. When we consider suitability, we are asking, are we exploiting the right source in the right location? There is an opportunity here to apply some of your knowledge from outcome one. And when you are selecting your case studies of renewable and non-renewable energy sources, Think about what are most interesting to you and which are most relevant from where you live. Although your knowledge must be case study specific, there are some general comments that can be made. When we consider renewable case studies, their effectiveness is often site specific. Different technologies suit different locations. But it can be said that from a global perspective, Renewable energy is very suitable due to its low carbon emissions. There may still be local environmental issues. When researching renew renewables, we may want to consider energy storage, government agendas and funding. For your non-renewable case study, we must acknowledge that the fossil fuels have been incredibly effective at producing energy for over 150 years. However, due to their carbon emissions, they are no longer suitable. If we are to address the current climate crisis and meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we must move to transition away from fossil fuels towards alternative technologies. When researching your non-renewable case study, you may want to think about this transition and the role of technology such as carbon capture. Ensure your case studies are specific to an energy source and to a location. Here are two examples. You may choose to investigate wind energy here in Scotland. Scotland has got huge potential for wind energy, both onshore and offshore, and this is due to our climate conditions and our geographical location. Wind energy has very low carbon emissions during both construction and operation, making it suitable. And wind energy can come at a number of different scales. It may be an individual turbine for a community or a landowner, or a large scale wind farm feeding into the national grid. It is often that wind energy in Scotland is tied in with major community benefits. However, there are issues with wind energy around the storage of that energy, so as it is available when demand is greatest. And of course, there are land use issues around siting the correct turbines in the correct location. We must acknowledge with all the renewable energy sources that they are just part of the energy mix for a nation. We are not trying to achieve all our energy demand from one source. If you do choose to investigate wind energy in Scotland, you might want to research some of the onshore wind farms such as the Whiteleys farm south of Glasgow or the proposed Viking Energy wind farm in Shetland. You may also want to consider the offshore wind farms in the Murray Firth and along the Aberdeenshire coast. Or you may want to take these issues and investigate them in a different country such as Denmark or Germany. For our non-renewable case study, you might want to look at the exploitation of North Sea oil by Norway. Hydrocarbons have created a huge amount of energy and have got a long established technology. The geology of the North Sea Basin means that the oil is there and is relatively easy to access. And Norway have used their oil fund to benefit their society. However, we must acknowledge that fossil fuels are incompatible with the current climate crisis and with meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We need to transition away from fossil fuels and we must also acknowledge there are massive subsidies which continue to move from national governments to oil and gas companies. If you do decide to look at fossil fuel extraction by the Norwegians, you might want to also consider the carbon capture technology which is aiding transitions or you might want to think about oil extraction by a different country such as the UK one of the Middle Eastern nations or the USA. In summary, 
the energy topic is made up of three outcomes with huge potential for your own case studies. You must ensure these are specific to energy sources and to locations. Energy is also part of the Global Issues Unit, so apply your knowledge from across the Higher Geography course. Your understanding in population, hydrosphere, urban, atmosphere and the other global issues will support your learning in this topic. Energy is a great way of applying your knowledge from climate change, whether it's been studied at Higher or previously at National 5. Looking at some of the past exam questions for the energy topic, you can see that in 2019 and in the specimen question paper, students were asked to describe a graph before going on to suggest reasons for a change. In all the exam years shown here, students were expected to draw on their case studies of either renewable or non-renewable energy sources. To maximise your assessment performance, be prepared to describe a graph and know your case studies of energy sources and their locations. But be watchful of wording. Are the questions asking about developed countries or developing countries? Are the questions asking about renewable sources or non-renewable sources? And irrespective of the energy source that appears in the question, does it ask for a source that you have studied? 